Women's basketball trailblazer and Hall of Famer Nancy Lieberman joins host Natalie Heverin to talk about her legendary career, the Dreams Court, Nancy Lieberman, Charities, and Pepsi Stronger Together donated, and the statue of Lieberman that was unveiled at Old Dominion last weekend. Locked on women's basketball starts now. <laughs> You are Locked On Women's Basketball, your daily podcast on women's basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome. You are Locked On to Women's Basketball. I'm Natalie Heverin, and I'm a features writer and the Atlantic 10 beat reporter for the next Thank you for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first lesson every day. And remember, Locked On Women's Basketball is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. On today's show, we're going to discuss what the statue of Lieberman represents to her, what donating a third dream court. Dream Court in the Hampton Roads area meant to Lieberman, and we'll take a look back at Lieberman's illustrious career. What does having a statue of you at Old Dominion and a street named after you mean to you? Well, first, uh, it doesn't happen a lot. Uh, It certainly doesn't happen a lot for women. And for this to take place at Old Dominion University, a place that is very special to me, um there's a lot of gratitude there's a lot of humility but it's i keep saying this i don't view it as my statue it might be my likeness but that statue doesn't happen without some of the greatest teammates in in the history of women's basketball whether it was ann donovan or ingneson or you know chris Cortelli, jan trombley angela Kopman, sue richardson Sandy Burke, I can go, you know, down the line. There were so many. And, you know, I have a Hall of Fame coach who gave us kind of the uh, the guidelines on how you win. Marianne Stanley, you know, three won three national championships as a collegiate athlete, has won again, you know, three as a, uh, a coach. So we, we, we collected all the right ingredients. And then what do you hope that, um kids especially young girls see when they walk past the statue uh, I hope they're proud uh I hope they consider uh, me one of their their sisters in this thing called life I hope it inspires every girl or boy that walks by a man or woman that walks into that you know performance center that they want to do something on a higher level. They just don't want their four-year scholarship at Old Dominion. They want to make a difference at Old Dominion because there's a legacy in the balance. I hope it, it spurs that that thought. And what would your younger self say to you now if she was to see not only the statue, but all that you've accomplished? Uh, my younger self would probably go, damn, baby, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> um, you, you couldn't have written this script because uh, our our world has changed so uh, dramatically, you know, over the last four or five uh, decades, especially in my lifetime. I was just happy to get a scholarship to go to college and to get out of, you know, my hood of New York and to change my life and have opportunity and, and try to find some happiness as a human being. Um, even though that all was connected to you know, how intense a competitor that I was. Um, I was tough. I was tough on my teammates. I had, you know, I had demands of how we were going to play. So, you know, when I look forward, you know, somebody pushed me. I'm sure I pushed a lot of uh, people. But here we are, and the young ladies that play for Old Dominion right now, they don't have to worry, will I get a scholarship? They don't have to worry, will I be on TV? They won't have to worry, will I have uniforms? They have it all because somebody already broke that glass ceiling for them. And that's every generation has to help the next generation. And so there's a responsibility and accountability. And that's how I see this thing in its totality. So no, I could have never expected where we are today. I mean, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have TikTok. 
for God's sake, we didn't have TikTok. How could I have functioned as a student athlete at Old Dominion University, you know, uh, without Snapchat <laughs> or emojis? Here we are. Uh, I've had to grow. I've had to learn. It's It's been a really cool ride. And what did it mean to you this past weekend to have everyone from high school teammates uh, to those that helped make the statue possible join you this weekend? That's a, it, it means that there was a lot of love and kindness and relationships. Uh, you know, a lot of people burn a lot of bridges in life. And I hope that says, you know, before I was a somebody uh, or did things that are were of significance that I maintained my friendships with my friends from, from Far Rockway High School. I have my friendships from PS 104 who have come to see me coach in the NBA, have come to see me coach in the big three in the WNBA. So they mean a lot to me. I mean, uh, to have them there uh, before I got to college, before I went to the Olympics in high school, and now to see them you know, make the time, take the time and energy to show up in 2022 is uh, pretty spectacular. It just shows how, you know, the bond, you know, we talk about lifelong friends. It, it actually was on full display uh, at the, the ceremony. And what has Title IX uh, meant to you in this 50th anniversary uh, of Title IX? Well, none of this would have happened without Title IX. You know, I'm on the cutting edge. You came in 1972 and I got my scholarship in 1976. So just think of all the amazing athletes that you've known or heard about since 1976, from the Sue Birds to uh, Maya Moore, Ann Donovan, Ing Nissen, you know, uh, Tarasi, you don't know, know anybody. Tamika Catchings, I can go on and on. Hall of Famers. They would not exist in the world at the level that they're at today. Title IX changed the game for us. It gave us protection. It gave us educational and athletic opportunities. It gave us a chance, you know, to play the game at the highest levels, to, to compete for championships. And it it just was the found it is the foundation of who we are. I mean, we're prepared for anything in life that comes our way because of that law. You know, Title IX is not an opinion. Title IX is a law. And it's the Educational Act of 1972. And it was signed June 23rd of 1972 by then President Richard Nixon. And although there has not been compliance at times with Title IX, it is powerful and it's real and we have to fight every day uh, not to have it rescinded. And what was your favorite memory from playing at Old Dominion? Well, my favorite memory were my teammates and my teammates and I winning. You know, winning the NIT, I'm going 30 and four, winning our first championship in 1979, going 37 and one in, in Greensboro at the Coliseum there in, in 1980, going 35 and one and winning back-to-back -back national championships. You know, I think we were something like 106, and I don't know, 106 and 104 and six, our last three years. That's unbelievable. It is absolutely, we only lost 15 times in four years. <laughs> so, and nine of them were my freshman year when we were 23 and nine. So the group that was assembled did work. I mean, you know, we ate, we we're little dogs and we ate and we just did it together. And that's, it's nothing I did that makes me proud. It's what we did that makes me proud. I can walk through an airport today and somebody will see an old Dominion logo and it they'll, inevitably they'll say, one of the greatest women's basketball teams ever. And look how many years later it is. And then the, the second championship, you know, in 85 with Ann Donovan. And then going back to the final four, I believe it was 1998 with Tisha and Clarice and Nairi and, and that amazing group of women. And, I, you know, fortunately, they, they lost to Tennessee in the championship game. But we have a really rich, powerful history together. And what was your uh, favorite memory or most memorable moment with your teammates off the court? 
Oh, um, I really can't share some of them because there was no, uh, there was no Facebook. There was no snap. There was, I'm so glad we didn't have cell phones in our day and age. Um, so the most memorable moments were never captured anywhere except in our mind. We were, we were, we had so much fun. I mean, we were so close with our men's basketball team. We did so many things together. I mean, we look at each other and go, glad we had no phones. Those were my most memorable moments, not sharing the memorable moments. Coming up next, we'll discuss the Dream Court Nancy Lieberman Charities and Pepsi Stronger Together donated, her experience on the 1976 Olympic team, the hardest player she had to guard, and what the sustained success of the WNBA has meant to her and more. Today's episode is brought to you by BetOnline.net. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your betting needs, and yes, even your women's basketball betting needs. I'm not a betting person, but I love that BetOnline.net offers these options for the WNBA, uh, the FIBA World Cup, and women's basketball in general. It's a very big deal. Throughout the WNBA season, the WNBA playoffs, um, BetOnline made it easy to place a bet with just a couple of clicks, and now you can bet on NCAA tournament future odds as well. From women's basketball to Major League Baseball, the NFL, NBA, and NHL, BetOnline.net has got you covered for odds, lines, and games. Head to BetOnline today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today. BetOnline, where the game starts. Thanks for making Locked On Women's Basketball your first listen every day. For your second listen, check out Locked On Sports Today. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. You know, you donated your 116th Dream Court um, on Friday. What's your favorite part about opening the courts in underserved communities? Every Dream Court is very unique to that community and the partnership we have. Uh, it could be with the city, the Park and Rec, Boys and Girls Clubs, Girls Inc. Everybody has different needs. And we, we want to be great partners. We want their kids to come on the court and, you know, mix and mingle. It's a melting pot of humanity. Nobody cares if you're white, you're black, you're young, you're old, you're Hispanic, you're gay, you're straight. Nobody, nobody cares. It just cares that we can be there together and we can laugh, we can have fun, we can compete, make everybody better. And that's, those are the moments you make your lifelong friends that actually look different than you. And it's okay. If the rest of the world were like that, we'd be super solid. Uh, you know, we wouldn't agree on everything, but we wouldn't wake up angry at somebody who doesn't agree with us. We could have free speech to say, hey, I'm a New York Yankee fan and know that I'm going to get hazed by some people. And we laugh about it. And, you know, we're just in, in a different place. Uh, and that's why the dream courts are essential. It started out as a basketball court and it has evolved into a pop up classroom. I did my best work educationally on a basketball court. I'm a critical thinker. I understand inertia. I know math. Uh, I certainly know engineering. I didn't really learn all that in the classroom. I learned that, you know, I was STEM before there was STEM with arc and, you know, uh, inertia. And like I was saying, everything else. I didn't, I, I didn't learn it in the classroom. And you know, we also have um, kids and cops programming. We have career readiness. We have financial literacy and we have civic engagement. So we freely give those five pillars of education to those sites so they can use that to interact with their kids. And we have over 5 million children a year, a year, utilizing these courts all over the country. And we're so excited and, and humbled uh, to be partners from we have two courts in Hawaii. Uh, we have courts that we just finished for Kobe and Vanessa, for the Bryan family to honor Kobe and Gianna. We did three courts for them. One in Anaheim where they met, and their love story started. And then we did two in Lower Marion, uh, Pennsylvania, 
you know, right outside of Philly where Kobe grew up. Um, this is what we do. Uh, we've sent 90 high school seniors to college. We're sending them to HBCUs. We help them write resumes. We bridge them to, you know, pay jobs and internships. We're just doing our fair share to help others. That's all we could ever ask for is to be a good teammate. Not a perfect teammate, but to be a good teammate. And pivoting back to you, um, you know, what was the most memorable part or something that stands out to you about winning the silver medal in the 1976 Olympics? I proved our coach, our Hall of Fame coach, Billy Moore, right. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but in, in 1975, I made the Pan American team. and We won the, the gold medal and in, uh, in Mexico. And I was a, a junior in high school, youngest player ever. In 1976, I was 17 years old and I made the, the USA team and we won the silver medal in Montreal. At that time, it was ABA USA, American Basketball USA. And Billy didn't get to pick the team, but they said to her, the late Bill Wall, who was our executive director, and I I learned this years later, said, Billy, you have one pick. You have the 12th selection for this team. Pick it, pick that player. And she selected me. She said, let's pick a player for the history of the game, for the future, excuse me, the future of the women's game. And I was so young that they selected me. And, I, you know, after all these years, all I'm wanting to have done was made Billy Moore proud. That that leap of faith, you know, she could have taken a Marianne Crawford, became Marianne Stanley. She could have taken some of the great players from that generation, the veterans, but she chose me out of high school. And I felt a very, you know, very important pull to make sure that I carried my weight. And hopefully, you know, I've done everything that they expected of me. And fast forwarding a few years, what did the opportunity to play professionally in the WBL mean to you? Well, I was happy there was a women's professional league. I mean, I always thought I was a professional when I went to college. I love Old Dominion, but Old Dominion didn't give me a scholarship because I was cute. They gave me a scholarship because I could play and hopefully increase revenues and put people in the gym and the arena and get attention media. I mean, we really set the stage for Old Dominion, the brand, because of the enormous amount of local and national attention that we got, um, you know, when I came from the Olympics and then winning takes it to a whole nother level. So we did our part. And that was that was really um, important to me. So the memorable moments that I had was helping to not only play the game, but to change the game and to grow the game. And you know, look at look at where they are today. Look at where women's basketball is today. It's those are the things that make me happy. And who was the hardest person you had to uh, guard in the WBL? In the WBL, the hardest person I had to uh, to guard was probably Ann Myers or Carol Blaisdowski. They were just such, you know, veterans. And, you know, Rosie Walker, you know, played with Stephen F. Austin. She was powerful. One year she was MVP. There were great players in that league, all Americans. I mean, USA players. And then, you know, Fast forward, you know, to 97, to the WNBA and, you know, our season, certainly Cheryl Swoops or, you know, Cynthia Cooper, uh, people like that, that were just at the, the prime, just starting their game. Tina Thompson, it was crazy. Uh, the talent, you know, all those years later. And, you know, you the you played in the last season in the WBL. Um, and played in um, more women's and men's leagues over the years. But what has the sustained success of the WBA, WNBA meant to you uh, after seeing the, the difficulty that it had to sustain a, a women's league? 
we were we were early. Um, not all the teams, you know, had the funding to be able to have long term sustainability and growth in the WBL, the Women's Basketball League, back in '79 and '80. Uh, matter of fact, you know, we were fortunate here in Dallas with the Dallas Diamonds because we averaged about 6,000 a game. We were doing well. Chicago, the Hustle were doing well. The San Francisco Pioneers. There were some, you know, teams that were doing well, but there were a lot of teams that were really struggling. You can't have a league with three teams. And when that it folded, it was sad because there was tremendous talent there. There just wasn't any TV or you know, major uh, marketing dollars to put behind it. But shortly after that, uh, I got a phone call from the new commissioner of the NBA, David Stern. And I think it might've been 85. I flew to New York. I sat with him. And I was so nervous being with Commissioner Stern. And he closes the door and he says, okay, before I'm done, commissioner of the NBA there's going to be a W and I was like what there's going to be a W this is 1985 Natalie okay this is like a dream coming out of the commissioner's mouth and he says my only hope is that you will be around you'll still be around to play so I'm probably somewhere like 25 or 24 years old and in my mind I'm like what's this guy talking about of course I'm going to be around you know, because you never see the end of the diving board. You only see what you do. And I'm in the middle. I hadn't even hit my prime yet. And he's telling me I he hopes that I would be there at the end. Well, fast forward 12 more years to 1997. And there it is. It's I'm now 39. It's crazy. And I remember opening day uh, in Phoenix. It was at that time, it was America West Arena. It was so super cool. Uh, we were sold out. NBC was doing the game. Ann Myers, my former teammate, Olympian, Hall of Famer, was calling the game. My coach is Cheryl Miller, Hall of Famer. And I'm looking around the arena going, this is unbelievable. I am in a jersey with my name and number, my number 10 on it. My kid is in the stand, in the stands, wearing my jersey with a number 10 and, you know, Lieberman Klein on the back. And I just thought, how how lucky am I? Here I am. And it was it was amazing. And I knew I was, I understood what David Stern said then. But that morning he called me on the telephone um, at my home. And he was visibly very emotional. You could hear it in his voice. And he said, I am so happy today. I am so happy you're here and you're gonna play. And I, I thought, how cool is that, that commissioner would feel that way? And then being able to play in the inaugural season. A lot of people didn't get that opportunity, and I did, and I, and I cherish it. Coming up next, we'll discuss Nancy Lieberman's favorite part about coaching, advice she would give to her younger self, and her favorite part of her journey, as well as the lessons she learned along the way. And, you know, you've done a lot of things in your career, coached in a lot of places. Overall, what was your favorite part about coaching? I love making or helping make people better. I hope that throughout my coaching um, that I've celebrated players, not tolerated players. You know, I was firm, I'm firm but fair. And the thing is you want winning is hard. It's really hard. It's a player. You know, we won at Old Dominion. We won in the, the WABA. We won the, the championship when I was playing. Winning is hard. Everybody wants to hold that trophy. And to be able uh, to coach a team and to help give them vision of what that looks like in every single day leads up to those moments. And that's why, you know, for me, uh, I would say when we won the championship in the big three in 2018 and Ice Cube handed me the trophy in front of, you know, 15, 16,000 people at Barclays Center and the confetti's coming down like you see in the championships. And here I have a group of NBA guys that have made millions and millions of dollars and they're on stage with just such happiness and their children and their family, wives. 
are there and they get to show their 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 fans, their friends who they are and that they're champions. And that means a lot to me. And reflecting back on your career as a whole, what's been some of your favorite moments or favorite parts of your journey? The relationships. It's always about the relationships. It's about loyalty. It's about kindness, about, you know, just being, you know, organic and, you know, caring about other people. Nobody, nobody has ever won by themselves. Nobody, not even the greats of the greats. Michael Jordan couldn't win by himself. Tiger Woods couldn't win if he didn't have great caddies and, and coaches and people helping him, his father, support groups. Uh, Warren Buffett, you know, or, you know, Elon Musk, the, you know, guys who have been uber wealthy, the wealthiest in the world. You can't do it by yourself. And you need people who are going in the same direction. And, you know, I, I, I've had a lot of success in my career and nothing that has happened to me. I've done by myself. I've done in collaboration with others, whether even if it's doing TV. You know, I do the TV for the Oklahoma City Thunder. I can't get on TV without Danny working the camera or Chris making sure the mic is on and it's working and the levels are correct. And John Jagu, my producer, and it's it's teamwork. I love teamwork. And looking back, what advice would you have given your younger self? Just to never stop working, wanting, or dreaming. Everything is possible. Um, you know, respect everybody, fear nobody. And that's pretty much the, the path I took. Uh, that was the information and the mentorship I received from my friend, my hero, and my mentor, Muhammad Ali. From the time I was 10, I fell in love with him and studied him. I met him at 19, 20 years old. He never let me go. And he had a distinct effect on me with social, racial justice, with um, poverty, with you know racial discrimination. He just opened my eyes to philanthropy, how to be an everyday champion. So, I mean, in the craziest of dreams, how would you ever expect that Muhammad Ali would you know put his wing over you and guide you and mold you and mentor you? And he, he always said to me, um, he says, Nancy, God made you special. You're going to, you're going to change the world. I didn't know what it meant because I was so focused on basketball, but I'm the right person for the right job at the right time. And I accept the mission. I'm not afraid. And what lessons were you able to learn from going from, you know, playing, uh, at Old Dominion um, at the early era of Title IX to then playing in the inaugural season of the WNBA and uh, coaching beyond that? Well, there's a lot in that question. And uh, I obviously I learned uh, stick to uh, determination. Uh, how, you know, I used to ask this question once to Michael Jordan how many times would you shoot a basket if there was no basket, if there was nothing? So people used to ask me from, from the time I left Old Dominion in 1980 until the inaugural season of the WNBA, I mean, do the math. I stayed. I played for the Lakers and Pat Riley in Summer League. I played for the Jazz and Frank Layton. I played two years in the USBL. I played against men. I got my ass kicked against guys. And I stayed. And I kept playing. I you could never see my total talent because I was playing against guys that were bigger, stronger, faster than me. But I never quit. And that that's part of my legacy that I wish other and I pray and hope that other young athletes, you know, just can stay focused on the goal. I wanted to I, I have a love story with basketball. It's deep, it's long, it's wide and it's true. And, you know, sometimes in life, you know, even like uh, my boss, <laughs> Ice Cube said to me one time, he goes, Nancy and I are very similar. And people were looking at us like, what? Uh, we were giving him an award at my charity. 
And he says, you know, I'm black, she's white. You know, she's older, I'm younger. Uh, she's East Coast, I'm West Coast. But we're, she's my spirit animal. And I'm like, I'm a spirit animal? Like, is that good? I'm it's good, right? I'm a spirit animal. And he says, sometimes you got to go over things. Sometimes you got to go around things. Sometimes you got to go under things. And he goes, Nancy and I, sometimes we just have to go through things. And we've been through things. And that's the greatest thing that I can offer somebody. Sometimes you're just going to have to go through things. And are you going to stay or are you going to quit? I'm not quitting. Not then, not today. Thank you for making Lockdown Women's Basketball your first listen. Tune back in tomorrow as Hunter, Joshua, and M are joined by Mark Schindler to talk about their WNBA draft lottery reactions. For your next listen, check out the Lockdown Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts.